And now it's my pleasure and honor to introduce the extraordinary Ron Sims. Ron chairs the Washington Health Benefit Exchange Board, which implements the Affordable Care Act in Washington State. Previously, he served as Deputy Secretary for HUD for President Obama. Prior to that, he served for 12 years as the County Executive of Martin Luther King Jr. County, where he was nationally recognized for his integration of environmental, social equity, and public health policies. I first met Ron when he spoke at our national conference in Seattle, where I was truly inspired by the work he has done on climate change, health care, and social justice. I am so happy that our paths have crossed again here in Tampa. Please with, help me welcome Ron Sims. It is wonderful to be here and also very, very intimidating. I have to though, thank Florida APA for their incredible work, the hospitality, the organization, the subject matter that was been presented. I was able to sit for a little bit in the Habitat group watching them and I was recalled hearing all of that and saying, wow, they've taken habitat planning and restoration to a brand new level, very, very extraordinary work. And so I want to thank all of you for all of your work. When I look at planners, I have, uh, you know, it's really, when I was in high school, I had a teacher who walked up to me and he said, you will be a master of all and a king of nothing. And I went, wow, hold it a second. But I didn't know quite, you know, at that time we were supposed to respect people, so I didn't quite know how to engage hostility and anger to comment. So I went and told my father, you know what that teacher told me? I will be a master of everything and a king of nothing. Dad, I will never rule. And my father said, bud, you're going to be a master of everything and a king of nothing. Now, my father was on a pedestal. My father went to Lincoln University in Pennsylvania because Ivy League schools didn't allow African Americans admission. So they were sent to Lincoln University on scholarship in Pennsylvania. My father spoke French all of his life. One of his classmates was Langston Hughes. And so my father was on a pedestal. So now my father, like my teacher, was telling me that I would be a master of everything and not the king. So when I look at planners, take this well. <laughs> and let me tell you why. There are a lot of things in the world that you don't want to be, but a planner is one of them. And let me tell you why. You have to know economics, politics, finance. You have to be very comfortable with science. You have to know a great deal of public policy. You have to be in, engaged with other groups that are dealing with transportation interests, business interests, housing interests. I mean, you are the place, like a library, where all things descend and you must sort it out and put it out as something that is cogent, is organized, and understandable. There are very few occupations in life where one person or one profession is given that responsibility and you raised your hands and you have it. You are of a, I call a life determining profession. The greatness of this country will depend upon your ability to move forward with the skills you have. Greatness of the state will be determined by the decisions you make, how you organize your work, how collaborative you are, what your visions are. You can say, no, it's going to be the public officials. They're only it's going to be as good as you allow them to be. You can create what we always call forces and limitations. I, was a, I remember when I was a King County executive, and we would have the, the planners would come in. And I used to tell the, my senior staff, can I just say yes? Just, I just, 
you know, and then you can tell me how much it's going to hurt. But just, you know, because they're going to talk, and I'm not going to understand a word they say, because they'll use big words, and they will also have this idea in their house, and they will know the code. I don't care about the code. They will know about, you know, the cost. I don't care about, just let me say yes. I was never able to have meetings like that. But I always said yes, because it was the easiest thing for me to do. Because even though I knew there might have been political repercussions, I knew I had intelligence on my side. I knew in the end that intelligence would prevail. So let me tell you about the things that now you face, a complex world. I have, you know, I have four perfect grandchildren. The, um, my sons always say that coming to our house always alters how they act by the time they get home again. And I tell them that is correct. This is a house of yes. <laughs> because I am not raising any of them. <laughs> but it is their world I often think about and the planning decisions that are going to be made about their world. But I'm also a reader. I have decided that I, my teacher and my dad were correct. And I think that anybody as a planner is going to be a reader. And it's going to be a wide topic list that you get to read from. So I'll give you some examples. You know, the, my wife has made a decision that it is time for us to walk and ride and, and lose weight. And I said to her, golly, you know, I'm losing weight by standing in front of the mirror and I'm saying, where? Where did, where has it disappeared because it still seems to be hanging around? But I remember being asked by a friend to attend a lecture by the science prime minister, the science advisor to the prime minister of New Zealand. And he was a geneticist. And he was basically a big wig in the World Health Organization. And, then, and everybody in the room was a geneticist. I was just there because a friend asked me to sit and see whether any, everybody who was talking was talking in layperson's term. And the answer was, no, they weren't. But I got some thrust. And it was the speaker said, he was kind of rotund in some respect. So he looks at me, the other kind of rotund person in the meeting. And he says, you. You, sir. He said, can I ask you a question? He said, when starving babies are born, what do they look like? I don't know. I just remember the ones I see in photographs. So I try to use a big word. I said, I believe they're emaciated. He says, wrong. They're fat. So I went, OK. I know he's going to explain this. And he did very logically. He says, your genes are elastic. I never knew that. Your genes change all the time. Some are short, over short periods, others over very long, longer periods. He said, your chromosomes, which we said would never change, and actually it's not true, 60% will change the base level, which is our primitive state. And so I'm listening to him, and he says, so let me tell you why a baby of a starving woman is fat. He said that, in, that, that neonate is collecting the capacity to store food. It has a storage capacity, and it's been drawing from its mother in order to live independently of her. It's storage. He said, so, sir. Have you ever tried to lose weight? I said, yes, constantly. And his argument says, well, let me tell you about Americans. You are yo-yos. You gain weight, you lose weight. You gain weight, and you lose weight. You join the Y, you join fitness centers, you gain and you lose, and you gain and you lose. But you know what happens to you every time you gain and lose weight? Every time you gain it back, you increase the number of cells in your body that are bad for you, which I didn't know. And I was going to go, I might explain the fact. And he says, just because your body sees weight gain, weight loss, gain weight, 
as starving. Your genes are working really well. So I went back home that night and told my wife, you know something, I learned something about genes. I said, you know, it's epigenetics issues. And I said, you know, the, here's what, I said, ask her the question, can you tell me what does a starving baby look like? <laughs> you know, I thought it'd be smart. And she says, having been in the Peace Corps and seeing starving babies, I said, oh, wow. She says they're fat. I said, let me tell you why they're fat. <laughs> so you probably say, what is it, how does that apply to you? The most significant factor today, and there's a lot of research being done on it, and it's become very conclusive. We plan as if there is no determinative impact genetically on the recipient, and the answer is you are wrong. You influence genes of other people all the time, for better or for worse. And the key is whether or not we're going to start saying, hold a second, why should we allow for anyone to influence genes negatively? And you're going to be the people who people are going to go to and say, here's what the new science says. And you're going to be the ones empowered to begin to try to articulate in layperson's terms the fact that a planning decision just is not a planning decision. It is a determinative decision. If you, and I'll give you an example. I've been, the, if you were uh, in public health, you realize that kids who are poor have high cortisol levels. A kid with high cortisol level cannot learn in school, period. Cortisol is a sign of, of stress and flight. That's what we do when we run when we're fearful. And you can be standing still, but if you fear you have those cortisol levels. We have spent billions of dollars on educational reform and never altered the neighborhoods that those kids lived in. They, we, we fussed the teachers and said the teachers can't teach, the school systems don't work. We accused them all kinds of things, but we never ever said that there was a responsibility of planners to help explain and design cities so that every neighborhood was functional and worked. Every one of them. If you look at the new affirmatively furthering fair housing standards, they have two. It used to be that in order to meet the civil rights standards of the Fair Housing Act, you had to provide capacity for people to move out of a neighborhood. But a lot of people said, I don't want to move out of the neighborhood. These are my friends, this is my culture, there's all kinds of reasons, a sense of, you know, of, of I fear less. So what we said is there's two standards now that are the body of law. One body of law is you still have to provide opportunity. And a second body of law is the restoration of poor communities. That is now a law requirement. And people say, well, do we have to ignore it? I said, you can ignore it, but you're gonna make a lot of litigators very wealthy. Westchester's, uh, people who sued Westchester County, that law firm got $7 million for being the litigator. So my issue for you as planners is, for you who are planning cities and looking at neighborhoods, well, I would tell you that it would be really incredibly important in that planning process to begin to say, you got to address function in neighborhoods that are segregated, and most of the country is, and neighborhoods that are poor. They should have certain features in them, streets, parks, gardens, co view viewing spots, collective viewing spots, they should be well lit. They should have wide sidewalks. All of those things that planners can influence is what turns a neighborhood from a neighborhood with kids of high cortisol to immediately kids of low cortisol. And it allows schools to work. So who has to be there? I saw the second, this morning you had a session on educational planning, which I thought was really, really good. And this is the first time I've been to a planning conference where you actually had school planning involved in it because school planning is actually integral to outcomes in life. And so if you have school planning, and you have your neighborhood plans, and you have your transportation plans, and you have all of those other elements in play, you can restore a neighborhood. And you will do more for less money than we have spent trying to change the lives of people who were poor and schools that have poor kids in them. 
because you've defeated the nemesis, the one thing that we never discussed, which is that neighborhood design, neighborhood fixtures, and neighborhood look and feel is a significant determinant in how people feel, and it isn't because they feel that way because they want to, it's because their genes yell out loud. It's their survival instinct. You probably say, oh, that's not true. I'm gonna say, but no, the scientific literature does. It's not Ron Sims's theory. It is now being written about as people begin to course through and say, what makes things work and what makes things not? So now you're going to have to be a scientist as a planner as well. At least understand them and then articulate what they said to people who have the authority to make decisions. But your cities and your communities will be so much better off because you've learned that. We've always said that zip codes are not an address, they're a life determinant. And we did that basically using the public health people. But I'll never forget going to this Chandler Felt, who was a demographer, and giving him an article that had nothing to do with demographics, I, it's data sets. He liked them. He went over and talked to the planners. The planners changed the world. I can remember going to them and having them tell me that zip codes are life determinants. They are not addresses. We know that conclusively. All the data runs that the federal government's run allows us to predict life outcomes by zip code of children and adults. How long you will live, what you're gonna die of, what your educational achievement is going to be, whether you're going to enter the criminal justice system or not enter it, are all influenced by zip codes. Your responsibility as planners is to turn a zip code into an address. And I would tell you, wow, you gotta wake up in the morning and be excited about that. Who wants a dull life? I mean, why would you want a dull, ordinary life? Why don't you want to be a life that is so close to being an ulcer? No, just joking. <laughs> but a life that is vibrant and exciting. We are the greatest nation on the face of this earth because people took risks. We are the only nation on the face of this earth that grew into a superpower with no common gene pool. We all got here by boat, plane, and land bridge, all of us. And we managed to fuse this into an intense, great nation. And all I'm gonna ask you to do as planners is to remember that and continue to infuse our greatness, to build upon what we do well, which is to learn to challenge, and to be absolutely fearless. Absolutely. You don't want to give me a plan that I could do without you. And unfortunately, my staff never gave me a plan <laughs> that I could do. They used to say, oh, Ron, go do this. It'll hurt for a while. But that's what's okay. You know, I can tell you, if you're a transportation planner, working with a planner, if you drive your car in a cute commute more than one hour a day to a destination and return another hour, that your likelihood, your likelihood, if you're a white male, is you're gonna have a heart attack in your between 72 and 75. So at those of us who are now trying to deal with health issues are trying to say, hold a second, that's not an issue of being well, that's an issue of being stress. It's 13 hours of stress. You wake up in the morning for an hour, that's stressful. You drive to work for an hour, you go to work all day, you drive back an hour, you go home for an hour, and one of the spouses wants to tell you, why don't we, can we talk about money? And you say, no, I don't want to talk about money right now. Talk about it later. That's called the opiate hour. 8.30 on TV is the beginning of an opening hour. We call it. It's the opiate hour. It's families gather. It's not families gather. It's husband and wives gather. And they just sit there and watch this TV mindlessly, identify with the characters, because it allows them to hide away from all kinds of other challenges. Our issue is then you make cities and employment tighter. It's a planning system. It's a planning goal. So we don't have sprawl away from jobs. And that's really hard to do. But its fact is I've always said planners need to talk to other planners and begin to talk about what we call health issues that surround it because our system cannot withstand the shocks that we now see today. Those of what we call very significant illnesses will break our system as we now understand it. 
But our issue now is that not just wellness, which is really, really important, that you own your health decisions, but the issue will be as we plan, can we plan a community that is healthier? People can talk about climate change. I'm a believer in it. I remember thinking that King County with the good news was going to be exempt from climate change. That it would all of a sudden blow over King County because we had done all these measures to reduce carbon emissions and all of that. And I just knew in my heart of hearts that we had done everything we were supposed to do to lower our carbon footprint significantly. And we went to the University of Washington and asked the University of Washington to do a report for us. What will King County look like in 50 years? And they came back with this report. And I remember telling everybody after reading the report that I was looking for another place to live. <laughs> what would we face? We were going to be subject to climate change whether I liked it or not. We were going to have more rain and less snow which meant we were going to have exacerbated flooding. And we had already had flooding. And I said, and it was going to be bigger in the winter because it was no longer we were going to have snow. It was going to just rain all winter, torrential rains. And so after getting this report, I said to the staff, what I should do? And they said, you know, you'll think of it. So I had a press conference. And I said, I don't know how I'm going to explain this. So I got up in a press conference and I said, I'm going to ban all flood control districts. There's only going to be one. I'm going to break them all up and consolidate them into one. I had no authority by law to do that. And the newspaper said, Sims to consolidate all flood control districts. And all the districts called and said, fine, do it. We're tired of this anyway. And so all of a sudden, I said, well, I'm going to tax the voters to do it as well. And they agreed. Why? Because we made a decision through our planning department that the only way that we could actually reduce the impacts was to consolidate, organize, influence, and control, and target the money that we were going to use for flood control. And we did. Out of the planning department. That wasn't out of Ron Sims's head. It wasn't out of a person who basically, I mean, we wanted, we had a lot of activists, but it was planning. So when we have climate change, all of you, and I've seen reports today, are going to be faced with that. And Florida, in a big way, working for the, and when you work for the federal government, you sit on different committees, and one of my I sat on was the CEQ, the Council of Environmental Quality. And so I was in Jane Chinko's group, which is a climate change group, and we did two. One is we had to get all of the agencies that were spy agencies and satellite agencies to agree on what we were seeing on the ground. And that was harder than you think because everybody wanted to protect their science. But eventually we got through that. And the issue was that we were going to see Greenland melt much faster and we were going to have sea rise. So we sea rise every coastal area of the United States. But that wasn't our problem. It was storm surge. And that was what people were forgetting. It's not going to be just sea rise. It's going to be storm surge as well. So we said to everybody, tell everybody we can about the mapping. Because we said planners, we didn't say electeds, we said planners, are going to, on coastal areas, are going to have to start planning for st storm surge, not just sea rise, if they wish to protect their economies and their communities. That's the science of it. That's the science that you know, and that's the science that you're going to have to be familiar with, and that's going to be the science that you have to implement. So you have a science side. You also have a population side, because the population is going to grow. People are going to live longer. And the real challenge is that people are living longer. It used to be that we knew when people were going to die and we planned for it. That seems to be brutal, but it was true. We said, you know, the average length of life is here. So we knew our capacities on all of our computers would say, this is how we're going to grow. You have two problems. A lot of people don't want to leave their communities and two people are living longer and they're going to live a lot longer. So your planning processes, which are going to be yours, because nobody's going to blame me they're not going to blame the retiree. They're going to say, why didn't you know? And you're the ones that are going to have to figure out, how do you house people who are retired? 
How do you house people who are like my sons, young, industrious, out of, their, out of college, starting their families and want to buy a house, or are in houses and want to be in bigger ones? How do you deal with that? And last night over dinner, I was listening to a discussion over this issue about who gets housing and who doesn't, what the cost of all that housing is. That was a really great discussion because it reminded me of my dinner table. But it is you, though, are going to be the deciders of it. And you're saying, no, it's not me. It's got to be somebody else. No, no, nobody else. You will have the data, and you will have to be having to plan this because it will determine the future of where people locate their businesses, the quality of life of the community as a whole, its economic outcomes, its social outcomes. It's all on you. But I can't think of a better group. I can't think of a better group. I wouldn't give this to elected officials. I was one too long. <laughs> one too long. It's on you. So I look and say, God, I want this country to continue to be great. So you have science. You have the epigenetic. And it requires you to do something that you are comfortable with that other disciplines aren't, which is getting out of your silo. I can remember when we were predicting heart attack rates on transportation, we had public health planners, land use planners, and we had the transportation planners, land use planners, and in a group. And they were all tasked just to say whether we should continue to sprawl out and was there a health cost to it, was there an environmental cost to it, what did sprawl actually mean? And they were all incredibly bright but they couldn't talk to each other. They were talking different languages and different concepts, and I had to go into the first meeting and encourage them, saying, please, please, please give me an answer. And I went in the second meeting months later because they were still arguing and saying, you know what, God, you're in my budget. I don't know why I should keep you there. <laughs> It'd be nice if you could just communicate with each other. I'm not asking for a love-in. I'm asking for an understanding. And they all came out with a document they agreed to using planning language, which revised our entire transportation system and our growth system in King County based upon health, land use, and transportation efficiency, and it's still in place today, and nobody wants to change it. That wasn't Ron Sims, county executive. That was a group of planners in a room who learned to work outside of those silos. You are going to be asked to do that a lot. And I would encourage you, encourage you to get out of those silos and hear what other disciplines are saying so that you're coordinating the same vision for a community or a county or a state or region. A biologist would tell you that the biology of any city determines its health. That's not talking to a sewer scientist, because King County Metro scientists would always give me new data on what people were eating and what pills they were taking. And it was fun for them, because waste treatment plants gather and sort and study all this stuff. And so they would say, you know, Ron, you know, this, this is what we're seeing. And I never knew why I was intrigued by those reports. I have no idea, I, really, I mean, what medicine people were taking, what new medicines people were taking. I mean, there were great reports, you know, until we realized that we're feminizing our fish or removing feminization from our fish, but whatever it is, sometimes we were, it was hazardous to what we call the bottom fishery. And we had to notify the State Department of Fisheries that we, in King County, were engaged in uses of various consumer products and prescription products that were actually uh, changing the life forms on the bottom of Puget Sound. Just kind of, we couldn't sue us, but we wanted them to know that. It is planners, though, that we went to for the solution. Our issue is what could we control? We couldn't control the discharge, but we could, control, con we could control the surface materials. Cars, all kinds of stuff that come from the surface and flow into the sound. And sure enough, we decided 
and I said, I always went on the planners. I said, my planners told me. I did that a lot. My planners told me. You know, I said, get mad at them at Costco. Don't get mad at me. And, <laughs> but it was them that all of a sudden said, here's how we should format. Here's how we should format. And we were able, in fact, by not handling what was going in the waste system, but because we found seepage from the, we call the, the sub, seepage from the system that, where water flows down streets and stuff seeping into wastewater, which gave us some interesting contamination issues, which required us to clean and sort those as well. But those are planners. I'm just telling you what the power of planning is. You think you're a neutral party. I just do the plan. No, you don't just do the plan. You set the rules for implementation. You set the vision for it. That's what planners do. You are not a neutral party. You're not a bystander. You're a, an implementer. You are so intimate to the process that it cannot be done without you. That's what you are, the master of everything, but never the king. <laughs> Planning. There are so many scales and so much needs to be done. So much. You will reorient this country and how we spend money if you plan correctly. Because you will put us in good, solid positions and responsible positions of governance and expenditure. Planning. I want Amina and I want Zanaya and Nayan and Maya to have a better role than mine. Planners can keep that promise. It'll be how we allow cities to grow, communities to grow, transportation systems to function, where we put parks, how we build our schools, who we get into our schools. The number one way of breaking down intergenerational poverty, which has plagued us, and we've had many a speech and many a program designed to do that, is public transportation. Harvard University looked at places that had done it and said, oh, they had really good public transportation systems. If you have a really good one and you locate it well, you can break down intergenerational poverty. If you decide not to do that, you've made a decision to maintain intergenerational poverty. But a transportation planner can work with a land use planner and say, this is how we should do that. So you don't have a person who's poor having to walk three miles to catch a bus or two miles, because we also know that everybody likes something that is close by. It's on you. So I would watch your agenda down here, and I keep thinking, you know, Florida, whether you like it or not, you have everybody's attention. Because people don't know, people say, well, Florida. Up in the Northwest, we say, well, it's a Florida problem. Let's see what Florida's doing, you know? What are they doing down in Florida? I mean, how are they dealing with climate change? How are they dealing with species change? Look at Florida, it's growing. It's dealing with multicultural issues. The housing issues are overwhelming to everybody but Florida, people who live in Florida. I mean, we look and say, what do they do in Florida so that we can take credit for them in King County when we do them? <laughs> Florida, you have become, whether you wish it or not, America's grand experiment. It is what you do and how you do it. And it is your planning skills that are going to be so integral, not the political skills. Politicians do what politicians do. It is the ability of planners to do all that underneath work to lay the foundation so that all of a sudden people are making better decisions in spite of their interests and in spite of their rhetoric who realize that they can transform and have viable and strong communities all through the 21st century. You're not going to stop the growth here. The issue is, how will it grow? You're not going to stop the issues of poverty issues. How do you attack it? The issue is not whether kids can go to schools here and be great students. The issue is, how do we take the neighborhoods around schools that don't function very well and improve those neighborhoods and see those test scores? And all of a sudden, it will be Florida, 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 Florida. I wanted to come down here because I just wanted to talk to Floridians. <laughs> because we think we're perfect in the Northwest. You have no idea the arrogance 
in my community, and I'm a part of it. <laughs> I tell people, oh, King County, we did this, you know, and everybody followed, you know. Sound Trance is doing this, Seattle doing this. But in the end, we begged and we stole other people's ideas. And we incorporated, incorporated them into what we were doing. So you are under the microscope. You volunteered to be under that microscope. You were not forced nor compelled. You made a decision to use the resources and the time in your life to be a planner. You were not a pencil pusher. You were not somebody that was supposed to be the anchor on bad ideas so that it would never happen. You were the people that have an innate sense of risk. You know a good plan from a bad one. You know how to get data out of your discipline so you understand the consequences of the decisions that people have to make so that they will be forced to make good decisions or bad ones, but they will know whether they made a good one or a bad one. And I can tell you, most electives would rather make a good decision and take flack. It is you who can narrow those choices that people make down. So we talk about Americans' healthcare system, whether you talk about epigenetic impacts. If you want to reduce people in jail, just rebuild their neighborhoods. If you want kids to learn, rebuild their neighborhoods. It is so simple. You want to break generational poverty, you find out where the buses are. I cannot talk about schools enough, schools, schools, schools. But my son's a librarian, and I would be remiss if I didn't say that I hope that many of you who are planners, or some of you who are planners, are talking about where libraries should be located. Access to a library is incredibly important. When I was a kid, I was put in a remedial reading class. I'll never forget that. So I was sitting there, and I remember announcing, I hope that Spot runs, jumps, breaks his leg, and drowns in a puddle. <laughs> and they put us in front of a machine that would click and click and click and click and click. And so I'd watch it, and then I'd fill out the form they gave us for a test, and then they do it again, and they do it again. And then they separated me from the other kids in the class and made me do it again and again because they said I was cheating. They said he cheats. Nobody can get a high score reading that fast. And I was reading 10,000 words a minute at 92% comprehension. But a librarian came in one day and my teachers were yelling at me for cheating because she knew my scores and said, I have books I want you to read. And I was in landlocked Spokane and my first book was The Sea for Sam and my second book was Moby Dick. It changed my whole view of me, of me that there was something outside of Spokane. With water and whales and fiction and beauty. And I never quit reading. Librarians are incredibly important. So it's on you, city planners, county planners, state planners. You have different disciplines that you're planning in, but it's all on you. You raised your hand. My father's and minister said, do not put your hands to the plow unless you're willing to till the field. You put your hands to the plow. It is time to till the field of opportunity and being extraordinary. My mother, I remember my mom, my mom was just aged so beautifully. She really did. She always called me Ronald. She's the only person I ever allowed to call me Ronald. Ronald was not, I was Ronnie, I was Ron. I was Little Sims because my twin brother was Big Sims, but I was never Ronald. Ronald was ex exclusive word of my mother. So she always said Ronald. So I was talking to my mom and she said Ronald, but so softly and so wonderfully. But I knew what I had to say next, so I said it to her three times, three times. I said, Mom, Donnie and James, Mom, love you very much. And they're in heaven with Daddy. 
but they wanted you to know how much they loved you. And I will be okay. And then I, she had kind of an odd look on her face, and I said to her, my mom, Mom, Donna and James are in heaven with Daddy, and they wanted you to know how much they loved you. And I will be okay. And then all of a sudden, there was this incredibly beautiful smile. And she squeezed my hand. And an hour later, she joined my dad and my two brothers. Their life is over because their time had come. A higher authority than anybody in this room determined that their job was done. But you've been given one more day and one more month, and one more year, and one more career to dream of the lives that are here. Your time is not done. You were woken up this morning not because you wanted to be, not because there was noise on the outside, not because, you know, you had this gift given to you of waking up and being able to say, I can make a difference. Somebody thinks I count. Somebody thinks I'm important. Somebody thinks I am great. Somebody thinks I can change the course of events that we face. Somebody does. A higher authority does. It's not the Baptist in me. It's the fact that it is true. So I want you to take this day you've been given as a marvelous and major gift, and I want you to say, I can and I will, and we will not be stopped. We will figure out how to form coalitions, work outside of our silos, all of a sudden have a state of Florida that everybody goes, whoa, wow, that is one awesome state. So people in my state can say, not that we want to be a Florida, I got this really cool idea off the internet, and we're going to do it up here so that we could all of a sudden continue to be the greatest country in the world. I don't want to lose to anybody. We're the world's grand experiment, and I don't ever want to be second to anybody. I am too proud. We have fought so hard. But if we let planning go away, we will be second rate. And doggone it, that is not an option. Greatness is an option. Our future is an option. I have promised it to my grandkids, and it's in your hands, and it's in the hands of many grandkids in this community and every community. That's what planners do. They keep the promise because their job was not done. Thank you and peace. Um, that was awesome. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Ron. Um, talk about inspiring us. Um, oh, that was incredible. Um, and I don't have anything close to following that. Um, I have a couple of quick announcements as you walk out. Um, we have some raffle winners, and um, um, it seems like such a letdown after that. Gosh. Um, <laughs> I just. Um, but um, we do have some pretty cool gift baskets from our awesome sponsors and exhibitors. Um, Little John Engineering um, in booth five had a Jack Daniels basket. How about that? And um, the winner was Latilda Hughes from the city of Freeport. So if you go by and um, pick that up today, that'd be great. Um, Kimley Horn in booth nine had a urban fold build your own paper city block city and the winner is Dottie Keaty from Lake County Florida so if you can go pick that up and Wade Trim had a wine and cheese basket and the winner is Corey Carpenter so if you can go pick that up congratulations everyone I hope the rest of your afternoon is as inspiring as our lunch speaker was, um, and uh, we look forward to seeing you tonight at the reception. Thank you.